So we're gonna build off of what we did in the last lecture. We're gonna continue with homomorphic encryption. We're gonna kind of finish it uh, today, hopefully. And I'll tell you um, a few more things we need to do before we get there. And uh, at the end, um, I'll tell you about a few open questions that uh, hopefully you can help you can help me solve. Um, then hopefully, if you have more time, we'll get into uh, other topics that we did not get to cover in class, um, including uh, something called private information retrieval, so this is sort of like private database access. Um, so that's for today, just to give you a preview of what's going to happen in, well, I guess the next two classes. Um, uh, Monday, we're going to have a guest lecture again uh, by you know, uh, Sergey Gorbunov, who is a, was a student here a few years ago, and now he's um, uh, on the faculty at uh, the University of Waterloo, and he's the CTO of uh, uh, a company that actually does sort of Bitcoin, blockchain, this kind of thing. So he'll tell you about uh, what this whole blockchain business is, uh, all in uh, 90 minutes. Okay, so <laughs> it's a brace for it. Uh, the last lecture, we'll, um, uh, we'll likely also have a guest lecture on topics in, uh, in cryptography that we did not get to cover, uh, hopefully identity-based encryption. So you get a sense of what else is there. There's a lot. Uh, you will have a sort of preview of what else is there. So that's the preview. Good. So so let's let's get back to what we were doing. So we saw an encryption scheme. Uh, we called this the uh, um, well the approximate eigenvector um, encryption scheme. It's an encryption scheme that is secure, assuming the learning with errors assumption, which is what we have been doing for, for a while. Um, the ciphertext in this game, so how does this game look like? The ciphertext, they, they, they are matrices. Uh, they encrypt bits, right? Uh, so each bit gets encrypted into a matrix. Um, and the ciphertext has the property, so this is what the decryption algorithm does. Right? The decryption algorithm takes the ciphertext, multiplies it with a secret key, which happens to be a vector. S is the is, is a random vector which is basically the secret key. And when you do that, you get a small error plus the message times the secret key times this matrix G, which is a fixed matrix, is a gadget matrix that we saw in class. Which is basically you know, so G is essentially the identity matrix tensored with uh, the vector that is powers of uh, all powers of one, two, four, etc. One, two, four, etc. Ground zero, seven. The great thing about this matrix is that you know uh, this matrix defines two operators, right? So an operator G inverse, which takes a ciphertext and produces another ciphertext C prime, which has very small entries, which are bits, which are zeros and ones. Right? Such that G times C prime equals C. So what these two operators are doing, the first operator is G inverse applied to a matrix, which bit decomposes this matrix, takes each entry, blows it up into bits. The inverse operator is just multiplied by G. It's a linear operator that pulls these bits back together to construct the, to reconstruct the original matrix. Okay, that's what the operator G and G inverse do. Good. So this is what the ciphertext looks like, and, uh, and now we want to kind of operate with uh, with ciphertext. We've given two ciphertext encrypting bits x and x prime, x one and x two. Um, I want to create another ciphertext which encrypts the sum of the two bits, um, so the XOR of the two bits, the product of the two bits. Um, in fact, I'll tell you how to do the NAND of the two bits. Okay, so not of NAND. Yes. Why NAND? Because this is one operator. This is one Boolean operator that is uh, complete for all Boolean functions. So if I do this, then I'm good. I can compute any Boolean function. And anything can be written as a Boolean function, therefore, any Yes? Is G inverse linear? G inverse is not linear. G inverse is not linear, but G, the, the inverse of G inverse, the multiplying by G, is clearly linear. Good question. This will, turns out, Looking way ahead in the future will uh, both help and hurt us. So the nonlinearity actually is, is actually a good thing. It turns out. Um, 
Okay, so the gene inverse is not linear, but inverse is linear. Good, so how do we do that? Let's again recap how this works, right? Uh, so I'm going to do two things. One, I'm going to take the two ciphertext C1 and C2. I'm going to create another ciphertext, which is which encrypts the hand of the two bits. Right? And then I'm going to not. Right? That's, that's the whole ciphertext. So, so let's see one piece at a time. Right? So, so C1 times G inverse of C2. Okay. So I claim this is a ciphertext. Okay, ciphertext of what? I don't know until I decrypt. Right? So, so let's check what the decryption algorithm would do on this ciphertext. That is multiplied by plus minus one. Right? Ciphertext is anything that decrypts to ciphertext of a message is anything that decrypts to the message on the secret. So let's try to decrypt and see what happens. Okay, so this is uh, well let's put brackets here. S minus one, let's concatenate minus one times C1 by this equation is the error plus x1 times s minus 1 times c times g inverse of c2. Yeah. Then now let's sort of expand it out. e1 times g inverse of c2 plus x1 times <coughs> s minus 1 times g times g inverse of c2 is c2. Yeah. So now let's put a bracket here. Let's find it out again. So what do you get? You get plus x1 times s minus 1 times c2. Well, again, the same story. Okay, so just apply the decryption algorithm, decryption equation again. So that's an error, a different error. C2 uh, plus x2 times s concatenate minus 1 times g. Yes, so far so good. Now let's again group terms together. Okay, so this is E1 times G inverse of C2 plus X1 times E2. So this I'm going to call it an error. Okay, so this is uh, the original sort of error in the uh, first encryption times some matrix. But by the way, this matrix has 0, 1 entries. So it's not if you stop at small numbers, it's not going to blow it up by very much. It, it's, it is going to increase the size of these numbers, but not by very much. In fact, we know exactly how much, right? Not about how much. Again, this is uh, x1 is a bit, right? And e2 is, uh, you know, a small error, so it cannot be too big again. And the sum of small plus small, small times small stays small, and small plus small also stays small, as long as small is small enough, uh, right? So but we will analyze all these things. Okay. Plus x1 x2 times s minus 1 times g. And this is precisely what an encryption of x1 x2 is supposed to look like. It's pattern match from here, right? An encryption of uh, something looks like what? Well, what? I mean, if you try to decrypt it, you should get an error, which is this. So this is the new error. You start, let's say. Plus the message is the product of the bits times s minus one times two. So it's precisely what it looks like. Yeah. And now I'm going to say, look, you know, uh, this is and. How do I do NAND? I need to do one minus. Yeah. So so NAND is uh, the knot of x one x two, which is one minus x one x two. So to do that, I'll, I'll just look at uh, what g minus. Uh, C1 G inverse C2 is my ciphertext. Okay, so again, matrix that you can compute. And now if you try to again decrypt this, you can redo a whole bunch of these calculations, and what you get is eventually well E star, actually minus E star, minus X1 X2 times uh, S minus 1 times G plus S minus 1 times g. So this would give you an error. Again, small error, negative of a small error, small. Plus 1 minus x minus 2 times s minus 1 g, which is precisely an encryption of 1 minus x minus 2, which is an anti x minus 2. That's that. End of story. 
key point. If you can do NAND, you can write every function as a circuit which consists only of NAND gates. Keep doing this. That's the polygon one. So I'm almost ready to declare victory. Right? Uh, except for two things. One, we ignored this error. We said, okay, small times small is small, but uh, yeah, yeah, we definitely uh, keep doing this kind of thing. So we need, really need to analyze how much the error grows and when the decryption stops working, which will happen at some point. <coughs> right, the error grows too much. So let's do that. Okay. That's the first sort of business. Let me tell you what is the second sort of problem I have with this game. Okay, so to define this whole thing, I need to fix a queue, right? I need to fix a module. So I'm working over this finite field as a queue. And I know that the decryption is going to fail when the error becomes too large relative to Q, more than Q over 4 would already kill me. Right? More than Q, yeah, that's that kind of story, right? So what does that mean? It means that once I fix Q, there is a limit to the number of operations I can do on things, right? And after that, I'm, that's it. I mean, the, 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 if I do any more operations, the ciphertext stops being good. It's too nice. That's no homomorphic interruption. You can, uh, you know, if you are the kind of the careful nitpicking type, right? You say, look, that's not what you promised. Okay, what you promised, what I promised, was to give you a scheme. I fix the parameters. I fix this, that, the algorithms. Yeah. Now you can take ciphertext in this scheme and compute any function you want. Okay, no limit. Yeah. That's not what this. That's a problem. Right? We'll, we'll fix it. Okay. So, in any case, what we construct here after I do the noise analysis is a very useful object. Uh, it's what I would call a leveled homomorphic inversion scheme. We'll, we'll get there in a second. What leveled means in a second. Okay, so let's let's get our hands a little bit dirty. Okay, so. So let's say beta, let's say the norm of the error, let's say the infinity norm of the error, 1 and error 2, right? Uh, you know, these are the two side errors in the two side effects, is at most some number beta. Okay, beta is some. That's about. So now I want to know what is the. Well, what is the error? What is an upper bound on the amount of error after we do the NAND operation? This is this is one thing I want. So what is it? I mean, here it is. I mean, here's an explicit description of what the uh, new error term is. Right. So let's look at e1. You know, I know that the infinity norm is. It. What is the infinity norm? You know, you take a vector, how large, what is the maximum size of uh, any of its entries? Okay, let's say. So, infinity norm is the maximum over i, the absolute value of e1 of i. e1 is e1 of 1, etc. Of uh, what is it? What is the size of Look at the maximum absolute, that's the infinity norm. Okay. So now I know that the infinity norm is bounded by beta of both E1 and E2. What is the bound on the infinity norm of, uh, of uh, E star? Yeah, that you can read off from there. Yes. So take each entry of uh, the product, which looks like what? It looks like E1 times some column of uh, G inverse of C2, which is a matrix. But it's a matrix with zeros and ones. Right? So when you compute the product, you're adding at most uh, M, which is a the size of the rows, the length of the rows, many numbers, each of which is at most beta. So this is at most beta times m plus x1 times e2. What can it be? I mean, x1 is uh, is zero or one. So you are adding at most uh, one more beta. Yeah. Just say for 
fine. Mm. Two out of ten is great. For my this month. Yeah, it's a, it's a gross upper bar. Okay. So every time I take two side effects and multiply them together, NAND them together, my arrow is going to grow from from this to this. That much I know. Yeah, it's a factor of M. M is what is the dimension of one of these matrices. Yeah, that's that much I know. Okay, fair enough. So then let's keep going, right? Let's keep uh, let's take a circuit, a huge circuit. Yeah, which has NAND gates. This how you draw NAND? So on and so forth. Yeah. Keep computing these NAND level by level. And I want to know how much uh, does the noise grow after I do a depth D computation. And this is easy to compute, right? Uh, after depth levels D, e, uh, sub D, really, is at most 2M to the D. What do I want? I want two things, right? I want correctness, which means that this is at most q over 4, something like that, Let's say at most q. Okay. Otherwise, I won't be able to be correct. So this is because of correctness. Right? Let's rewrite this a little bit. It says q over beta has to be at least 4 times 2 and to the d. So again, this is correctness. Yeah, same equation. Right. What does security say? Security says that, again, q divided by beta. Beta, oh, what am I, what is beta? Beta 0, which is the initial error. Let's call it p. Okay, so, so the initial error. Okay. Yeah, this is beta 0, the initial error. So we know that the signal to noise ratio in LWE cannot be too large before you lose security. Right? So if it becomes more than 2 to the n, you are you're out for security. So ideally, it has to be q over b has to be less than 2 to the n to the epsilon for some constant epsilon smaller than 1. Yeah? And how, how small a constant? The, you know, will dictate how much security you get, how much time it takes to break of the viewing and so forth. Okay, so this is, these are the two conditions. This is my security. And that guy's on correctness. Yeah? So what's the good? Yes? Do you negative numbers work here? Because if they do, then the bound should be square root of two and something. You're saying the bound could be better? Yeah. Of course. But I'm not going to. I'm going to be extremely permissive. Okay. Uh, yeah. This 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 bound is correct. Yes. It's not the best bound. Yeah. You're right. Uh, in fact, you can say, look, I mean, these uh, zeros and ones. If you really do the right thing, um, you can do a set limit theorem, the calculation, so you get square root of that. In fact, that is what people do. But you know, I don't want to. I'm not assuming central limit theorem in this case. <laughs> yeah, but this is this is this one. So what does that mean? I mean, uh, this, these these are two opposing constraints, right? So Q over B is at least so much, uh, most so much. Now we need to solve for uh, yeah, we need to solve. Solve for what? Though? Well, I'm going to fix M. Yeah. I'm going to fix m. m is n log q, actually, if you think about it. The, the dimensions of g are n by m, which is n by n log q. So the only indeterminate here is d. So the question we are asking is, how big can d be before this equation is violated? Yes, sir. and therefore you lose parameters. So then you say, look, you know, let's take logs on both sides. n to the epsilon is at least uh, d log uh, I'm going to ignore constants left, right, and center. Okay, you can put them in. Doesn't matter. 
M is n log n. Q is due to the n to the epsilon, so log Q is n to the epsilon, so the, what's inside here is like n times n to the 1 plus epsilon, something like that. Yeah. So in any case, this is roughly order of log n, order of d log n. Okay. And this is what happens. So in other words, d can be, d is at most n to the epsilon divided by some constant times n to the epsilon divided by log n. That is how far you can go before you lose steam, before your error becomes too large. Okay. That's, that's what you can do. So what does that mean? You fix n, which is a parameter, which is a security parameter, the length of the secrets in the QE. You fix epsilon, which determines how much security level you want, right? I mean, uh, this, you know, these kind of parameters can be attacked in time 2 to the n to the 1 minus epsilon. So fix a constant epsilon, ha, okay? That's what it is. Now you can go up to n to the epsilon, so square root n if epsilon is half. Yeah? That's one way to think about it. Of course, there's another way to think about it, which is you say, I don't care about your crypto n and L to QE and so on. So what I want to compute depth 100 circuits. That's it. Okay, so I'm an application developer. Okay, I don't know what L to QE is. I couldn't care less. Okay. So I want depth 100 circuits. Now you tell me that, or rather I tell you that. And your goal is to pick the parameters of the scheme, including the n, such that I can actually compute depth 100 circuits. And of course you can do that. You just look at this inequality in the reverse. You set n to be large enough, so depth d circuits can be computed. And you, once you fix n, you have to fix all the parameters in order to satisfy these inequalities. Yeah. This so in other words, what this scheme gives you is the following ability. You tell me an upper bound on the depth of the Boolean circuit, the NAND circuit that you want to compute. I will set the parameters of the scheme so you can compute any circuit of depth up to that number that you that you promised, you know, that you don't care anymore. Yeah. Only care about depth at most, D circuit. This is called a leveled homomorphism. Leveled because, well, you can only do so many levels before you run out of This is already amazingly useful because really I claim that anything in life you care about which is natural can be written as log depth. Uh, Josh might uh, disagree. Um, uh, log squared okay, depth Boolean uh, <laughs> circuits. Okay. Log squared you can, you can eminently handle. You can, you can handle up to n to the epsilon, which is bigger than any polylog. This is already extremely useful. Yeah. It's called a level. Are there policy circuits which benefit from because there's an exponential gap between a large depth and a small depth? Say again? Like, if I have a circuit that yeah. is poly sized at a larger depth, can I compress it to something that's smaller depth? After, if it's large enough, uh, like, Wait. I know there's a difference between 3 and 4. But no, you pay in the width. Right? Uh, in general. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, in general, you pay every. Uh, yeah? One, you decrease in depth, you pay uh, a multiplicative factor in the, uh, in the, uh, in the width. Uh, of course, you can compress everything to depth 2. Right? You can write everything as a CNF or DNF, but then 2 to the n width. Right? 2 to the n side. So, the, so okay. So, uh, okay. So, so there are things you, you know, that, that you need large depth to what well, we believe need large depth to compute. In fact, you have even seen examples where that is the case. Uh, well, actually, now that I think about it, you know, uh, computing Jacobi symbols, you know, the cryptographic type of computations, computing exponentiation, computing GCDs, all these things we believe take um, large depth. But who cares about computing GCDs and uh, blah, 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 you know? Uh, we care about computing, you know, we have a sequence of numbers, like, you know, in the motivating example, you have two databases. You want to compute a correlation between two columns of a database. Come on, okay, this is a small depth computation. Uh, you want to do linear regression on an encrypted data set. 
So it is, you know, real world is small uh, Of course, you can find counterexamples to what I'm saying, but, uh, but uh, okay. But but you say, look, you know, very nice. Um, your sales pitch is uh, is inspiring. <laughs> okay, but I don't buy it. Okay. They say there are circuits which have arbitrarily large depth. In fact. I would want you to fix the scheme, and then I would want to kind of decide in the future what is the depth of circuits I want to put you in front. Like, you know, these encryption schemes have to be standardized at some point. Right? You know, the, the, the American NIST has to come in and say, look, here's a rubber stamp. Okay, Q equals 114, Okay? Okay, that's a Q. I mean, if you change the Q, it's not, it doesn't conform to the standards anymore. So you want to fix the scheme and then decide be able to decide how large, you know, how big, how deep this is itself. Well. That we haven't. That we don't have. Okay. That's the one last step that uh, we need to show. Does that make sense? It's going from leveled to what we call you know, make a names, right? A pure fully homomorphic dimensions. So, okay. It's pure. Okay, so let's do it. Okay, so I'm not going to get into the math anymore for you know what I'm gonna say. Just think of having an encryption which can compute circuits of up to a certain prescribed depth. What is that upper bound? It is a function of the parameters of the system. That's it. That's all you need to know. Rest. Let's try to do it. All right. So, so let's think about homomorphic encryption the way we did, you know, as a, you know, in the lens of uh, two-party computation for the moment. Okay, so the two parties. It's a party of the function. And this function bought with the input x, it encrypts x and sends it to, uh, to Alice and keeps the secret key for himself. Okay. And Alice is supposed to do this homomorphic computation, write f as a circuit and do these computations. Yeah, that's what she's supposed to do. Except, unfortunately, at some point, she gets stuck because d becomes too large. So what does she do? What does she do? I don't know. What do you think? Yeah. At that point, if you do anything to the ciphertext, uh, yeah, it explodes. I mean, it becomes something that cannot be decrypted by Bob anymore. Okay. Yes? Uh, I was going to suggest sending it back. Oh, okay. Beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. Very good. Very good. Right? So, um, very good. So, send it back to Bob and say, look, decrypt it. And re encrypt the, the, the result, which is an intermediate step in some intermediate step in the computation, with a fresh noise. Send it back. Now I can keep going a little bit more. Yeah? Send it back. Good, so, uh, okay, so, uh, fair enough. Except it has uh, two things which I don't like. Okay, one is that this is attractive. Right? I mean, so it's not encryption you know, in the purest form, which is you send me an encryption, I compute something and send it to you, email it to you, and you decrypt. Okay? Uh, talk, no talking about it. Okay, that's not. The second thing is that if you do this, then Bob is going to know something about this function right? Uh, beyond the output. He's going to know the intermediate results of this computation, which might reveal more information about the function than Alice and Ted. That's also a problem. All right. So here's another solution, brilliant solution. Yeah. Uh, Bob sends the secret key to Alice. Okay. And then Alice can, you know, whatever Bob did, Alice can do herself, decrypt, re encrypt, and do the computation. But that's you know, much more pathetic than uh, Alan yeah, does make himself. Too bad. Let's think for a moment, okay? Uh, you know, uh, there are good stupid ideas and bad stupid ideas, okay? 
you have distinguished with me. I claim this is actually a good super area. So what does Alice want to do, right? So Alice wants to do noise reduction. Meaning what? She takes the ciphertext C, computes a little bit, gets the ciphertext C prime, and again, this has noise beta zero, and this has noise beta prime, which is very close to Q, let's say. Let's say Q over uh, eight, or something like that. Yeah. So it can still be encrypted, but you can't do any more computation on top of it. What she wants to do is to take the C prime and create a C double prime where the noise is beta zero or something much smaller than uh, beta prime. So this is what I refer to as noise reduction. She wants to do it all by herself. Of course, not talking to you. Yes. Maybe you can do something where you homomorphically do sending the secret key. Good. Like a okay. double encryption. All right. Good. Okay. So let's, uh, let's try that for a second. So one noise reduction step is my stupid idea. Okay. So send it to send Bob sends. Uh, what is it? Decryption is a noise reduction algorithm. Okay, it's a beautiful noise reduction algorithm. It removes all noise, it just gives you the message. Okay. It's not a secure noise reduction algorithm. That's the really stupid idea. Um, the way to make it actually work is to not have Bob send the secret key to Alice, but she sends the encryption of the secret key, under the secret key. What does that mean? Take the secret key, blow it up to bits, right? Yeah. So this encryption scheme encrypts bits. So and the secret key is a vector with numbers and CQ. So never mind. Blow it up to bits. Take each bit and encrypt it onto the secret. Key. Okay. Send it. Over. Why in the world would this help? Why in the world would this help? So what Alice is going to do is the following. She says, "Let me write down the following circuit." which is the decryption circuit, right? the decryption circuit for this. Uh, it's a decryption algorithm for this uh, for this encryption scheme. Of course, I can write it down as a circuit with NAND gates, if you will, right? With, uh, what does the decryption algorithm expect to take? It expects to take two inputs, the secret key and the ciphertext, okay? So the ciphertext, I know what it is. Let me hard code C prime. Into the, into the decryption circuit. Let me hard code the values of C prime into the decryption circuit. The secret key for Alice does not know. Okay? So look at the circuit. So this is unknown. So look at the circuit that takes the secret key as input. It has the ciphertext C prime hard coded in it. And it outputs the decryption of the ciphertext C prime. This is a Circuit. This is a legitimate circuit, the function f, right? In fact, it's a function f that depends on c prime. Okay. Good. So I know that if I apply the, this function to the secret key, I get back the bit, the, 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 you know, the bit uh, well, x prime that this guy creates. So there's a function. If I feed some input to it, I get x prime. Homomorphic encryption says that the same function, if I feed the encrypted input to it, I get the encrypted output. Which means what? If you feed in encrypted secret key, the encrypted input, you get the encrypted output, which is X prime, right? Yeah. Whatever happens on plain text, homomorphic encryption lets you do on ciphertext. So you can wrap encryptions around each of these objects. Things work out. So now you say, that's bizarre. Okay. What did you start with? You started with C prime, which is an encryption of X prime. What did you get as a result of this process? An encryption of X prime. It doesn't make any sense. Why didn't I output the identity, you know, why didn't I just output my input? Yeah. What did I do? I started with an encryption X prime, and I got another encryption X prime. 
the key thing to realize here is that the noise in this encryption of X prime could actually be a lot less than the noise in C prime. In fact, it is independent of the noise in C prime. Why is that the case? Let's think about, so what is the noise in this ciphertext? This is a function of uh, the depth of the decryption circuit, the de depth of the circuit that you're computing, and the initial noise in this ciphertext. Yeah, so, so you started with some noise, you computed a circuit, which is a decryption circuit, right? And these two parameters tell you what is the noise in the output encryption of X prime you get. And we have a formula that uh, that computes uh, that computes that quantity. So this is 2m to the power d, but d is the is the decryption, the depth of the decryption circuit. D depth is the depth of the circuit which decrypts, which takes the input secret key and decrypts a particular cipher. So now the thing to observe is number one that this number does not depend on the noise in C prime. And where did it appear? It doesn't appear anywhere. Yeah. This noise in the ciphertext is independent of the noise in C prime. The only thing we used is that C prime is decryptable. When you run the circuit on C prime, you get the answer. That's the only thing we used. Other than that, no dependence. Does this make sense? And now you say, number two, if the decryption algorithm magically has small depth, okay, constant or logarithmic depth, you're good. Because you're starting from a potentially high noise. When you run this procedure, you get a much smaller noise. And then you do one more operation or a few more operations until you get to that high level. You run this procedure again. So what you proposed, the interactive process, we are shortcutting it to uh, essentially have us doing everything ourselves. Right? This is called bootstrapping. Okay, so what we want is that this number is less than uh, q over 4 is not good enough because I want to take the ciphertext and do another operation. So it has to be sufficiently small that I can actually do another operation. So let's say q over uh, 100 n or something like that. Okay, just like that. Okay. And now you can do one more operation, do this process again, one more operation, do this process, keep going. Uh, that's it. The only thing to check is that the decryption algorithm has small depth, in fact. And this is not very hard to see. All we need to show is that the decryption algorithm has poly log depth. Once you get that, this guy can evaluate up to n to the epsilon depth, so you can. Uh, yeah, that's all you need to show. It's small depth, small is polylog. So what is the depth of the decryption algorithm? What is the decryption algorithm to begin with? Okay. Um, you have a ciphertext, which unfortunately I erased. Um, so here is the decryption. Right. As a function of the secret key. C is a is a matrix. But like we saw in the last class, you don't need all of C to decrypt. You just need the last column of C. Then you take an inner product with S. Uh, and you check if the result is close to 0 or close to Q over 2. If it's close to 0, it says an encryption of 0. Close to Q over 2, it's an encryption of 1. That's what you do. So the decryption is one compute the inner product of the C to P with the last column of uh, C last is the last column of, uh, of C to check if this number is close to zero. If yes, output zero, else output one. So that, that, that. So this computation is uh, is basically in a product. 
Okay. What is the depth you need to compute in a product? Uh, you need to multiply many numbers, right, in parallel, n numbers, n pairs of numbers in parallel. Then you need to add all these things up. Yeah. So what is the cost of multiplying? Well, you have to think about it. Multiplying molecule, you have to think about it. You can do it in depth poly log um, q. Right. Actually, actually log in the description length of the numbers, which is log q already, so poly log log q. So write down the decryption circuit, right? Decryption circuit. This looks like um, SI times CI. S1 times C1 up to Sn plus 1 times Cn plus 1. Then you need to all add all these things up, a giant add up. So this I claim has left is depth poly log log q. And this has depth uh, log n. Right? I mean, so n numbers you add, there's depth log n. Yeah. And then at the end, you need to compute this threshold, whether something is close to zero or close to uh, or not, which is basically checking a bunch of most significant bits of this number. At the end of this computation, you get the number in the bit of representation, check the most significant bits. Yeah, check that all of them are zero. And that says, well, this number is close to zero. Maybe you need to shift by a little bit and then check. And this is sort of pretty This is again only. Log, log, yeah. So in total, if you look at the entire depth, it is a polynomial in uh, log n and log log q. Q is what? Q is 2 to the n to the epsilon. So log log q is something like epsilon log n. So the whole thing is poly. That's it. You need to be, you need to check this carefully. You need to write every all pieces down. But really, the intuition is that the decryption is in a product. In a product is extremely parallelizable. Together with sort of multiplications of numbers, again, extremely parallelizable. Checking if the number is close to zero, extremely parallelizable. So the whole thing is uh, small depth. Poly log n, log n cube, which is really poly log n. Because q is at most exponentially length. Log log q and log n are the same. Good. That's it. That's uh, that gives you a really fully homomorphic encryption scheme. Yeah, the other would grow. Yeah, that's right. Why not use this? Good. You can. You can. You can. In fact, in fact, you can. So, in reality, if I use when I use bootstrapping, I'll never set my Q to be two to the n to the epsilon. I'll never do it. I'll set it to be just above the bootstrapping above, right? To ensure that I can do one operation and then I bootstrap, and then I do one operation, and then I bootstrap. And every time I do this, the error gets really close to the threshold, but below. Okay. So I can do the whole thing with Q that, uh, that is not true to the entity epsilon, but rather quasi-polynomial. Okay. That makes that means my scheme is more efficient now, because I don't need to deal with n to the epsilon bit Qs, but only polylog n bit Qs. Okay. So you can do all these things. Yeah? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, do we have reason to know or believe why encrypting the secret key should not reveal any information about it? <laughs> so that's one piece that's missing. Okay. Why is sending the encryption of the secret key any better than sending the secret key? Is a is it's a blunt way of asking this question. Yeah. All right. So at this point. We know of, okay, so 
what is the guarantee you want? You want the encryption scheme to be semantically secure. In other words, you know, whatever I'm sending on top of uh, uh, this guy should be secure, even given the encryption of the scheme. Yeah, that's the requirement you want. And that's called circular security. Okay. Semantic security, you know, the, the Golvasa Mikali security, the DA security does not guarantee anything about when you're given an encryption of the secret. In fact, maybe you did this in, in a homework, yeah. I don't remember anymore. Yeah. yeah. So you can create encryption schemes where encryption of the secret key is a really terrible thing to publish. However, that encryption scheme, again, if you remember back to your solution, is extremely contrived. Okay. For this encryption, for regular encryption scheme, we know of no attacks, you know, against semantic security when you publish um, uh, an encryption of the secret. Okay, that's number one. Number two, we know no way to prove that this scheme, when given the encryption of the secret key, is as secure as LWD. Right, so ideally, that's what I want to, want to do, right? If you can break this scheme, the security of the scheme, then I have an algorithm that solves LWE, and therefore you say, okay, under LWE, okay. That we don't know how to do either. So we are in this uh, intermediate, uh, you know, uh, hell, where we neither have an attack nor have a security proof. In fact, people have tried to attack quite a bit, quite a bit, I don't know. People have tried to attack, okay. Have failed. People have tried to prove security. I've been trying on and off for the last 10 years. <laughs> I've failed. Okay. Um, so this leads to probably the most important open question and the theory of homomorphic encryption, which is put it put it put it uh, put it succinctly, uh, put me out of my misery. Okay. That's, uh, yeah. So either prove that um, uh, that uh, this scheme is uh, is uh, is uh, secure, right? So cross security holds under the UE or under another assumption that is more palatable, or attack it. Okay. Um, and even if you attack it, I have ways to kind of fix this. So you know there are okay. so you don't need circular security here. All you need is to publish some key cycle. What does key cycle mean? An encryption of, you know, pick 100 secret keys, okay? So you publish an encryption of secret key 2 under secret key 1, secret 3 under 2, 4 under 3, so on and so forth. At the end, the tail joins the hand. Yeah? That still lets me do bootstrap. If you have to think a little bit more, that every time you get an encryption under a new key, and eventually you join back and say, well, <laughs> let's keep going. Very good hour, right? That suffices. Now, if you break this, I'll say, thank you very much. Break that. <laughs> okay. Um, it is a great open question. Okay. So it's a, it's a beautiful open question. Uh, I don't know any need to refer. indication. I'd be very surprised if this can be attacked. This gave seems like a very unlike the encryption scheme that you designed <laughs> to, uh, as a country example, to. Uh, to for security, so we're very surprised. Okay. Another open question, which is is to come up with a way to do fully homomorphic encryption, which completely bypasses this issue of circular security. Right? Why do, why do you mean? This is one way to do bootstrapping. Yes. There's no good reason why this should be the only way. And uh, but let me make an advanced comment in parenthesis. If you don't follow the next five minutes, that's okay. okay. Here is a potential another way to do bootstrapping. Okay. Um, the issue in this whole process is circular security. When I encrypt a key under itself, it's problematic. When I encrypt a key under another key, and this key under the, you know, the key two under key one, and key one under key two, that's also problematic. Again. But let's say we don't do that. Let's say what I'm going to do is I'm going to create n to the log n many secret keys. Okay, n to the log n was a polynomial is more than you will ever want to, the depth of any circuit that you want to compute, right? Asymptotically. So n to the log n many keys. Yeah? 
key 1, key 2, key 3 up to key n to the log n. I'm going to encrypt key 1 under key 2, key 2 under 3, 3 under 4, up to n to the log n minus 1 until n to the log n. So now there's no key cycle. Yeah? This is actually okay to publish because, well, then you have to you do the equation, but you can sort of argue security going from the back to the front. There's no supply. Okay, that's that. End of story, right? Come up with the n to the log n keys. <laughs> okay, so the, uh, i is Bob. Okay. Bob computes all these sort of chain of encryptions, sends it over to others. Then you say, what is n to the log n? n to the log n is more than a polynomial. Poor Alice is a polynomial time algorithm. Okay, so she cannot even read uh, just too many bits to send around. Right? So it's not going to work. Again, there are good stupid ideas and bad stupid ideas. I claim that this is a good stupid idea. Why? Because you can do the following. Potentially do the following. So, solution, the stupid idea is encrypt C to key 1 under C to key 2, encrypt C to key 2 under C to key 3, etc., etc., encrypt C to key, uh, in fact, let's say even exponential, okay? 2 to the L minus 1, um, yeah, so 1 and Too long is a problem. So I say, look, I mean, these secret keys, they don't have to be random. It's OK if they are pseudo random. Okay, so I can potentially compress the description of these keys into one seed of a pseudo random function and say, SKI is a PRF evaluated on I with the seed. Okay, so I compressed the description. And I would say, look, uh, I send the seed across. But that's a really stupid, that's a bad stupid idea. Okay. Uh, because if I send the seed across, you can expand it and you can derive all the secret keys, and it's worse. But imagine that I can do the following. This is Alice. This is Bob. Imagine that Bob can do the following. He can create a box okay, which uh, takes as input i. Computes SKI and SKI minus 1. How? Right. SKI is a PR of i and SKI minus 1 is a PR of i minus 1. And with a seed S that is hard coded in it, with a seed K. So that is hard coded in this program. And then it outputs an encryption of secret key i minus 1 under secret key i. Okay, this, this is a program. It's a C program that has a PRF seed in its, uh, in, in its head. On input i, it does this process. It computes the two keys in the chain, encrypts one with the other, and outputs it. Okay. Now I say, look, that's great. It's a short program, right? Let me send it over. Let, let Bob send it over to others. And I say, that's also stupid. Because I look at this program you know, line by line, and I say, aha, here. Key, PR of key equals one zero zero one 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 zero zero zero. Okay, that's that. All right. Mm -hmm. But imagine that you can obfuscate this program. What does that mean? Rewrite this program in a way that when Alice looks at it, she can run it on inputs, but she cannot unscramble it and get the PR key. Let's say this is possible. Okay. I'm going to denote it by. locking this program. Right. It's not encrypting this program, it's obfuscating this program. Suppose this is possible, problem solved. Problem solved in a way that does not rely on circular security. If there is no circular security here, there is just a ginormous line, a chain of encrypted values. And what this program is letting you do is on demand generate the ith link in the chain. This is another solution concept. But this assumes that there is a way to obfuscate programs, which is the second open question for today. Okay. Come up with a way to 
obfuscate programs. In fact, I don't care about obfuscating Java programs. I care about obfuscating this program, which is secure in the sense unreverse engineerable out of the LWB assumption or the factory assumption. I don't care. Would they encrypt SK under a different key and then send encrypt SK off the encryption of SK? And now, if I can break this circular security, I can break the other encryption of SK. Uh, no, no, okay. If you, if you say this again, I'll. I'll <laughs> doesn't work. It doesn't work. I encrypt SK under a different scheme or under a different key. Under a different scheme? Under a different key. Different key, okay. Uh -huh. And then I encrypt it on the SK again. On the different key, yeah. And then you encrypt this whole thing? Yes. On the SK. Yeah. And more people know SK Prime. Sorry? More people know SK Prime. Oh, that's a problem, I guess. If both, pe if both people don't know SK Prime, then you're in trouble because everything will be under SK Prime and you'll never be able to get out of it. If both people know SK Prime, then this is morally an encryption of the secret key under the secret key. It's not quite, it's actually an encryption of some function of the secret key. It's a publicly known function because you just gave them SK Prime under the secret key. It's just as bad. I mean, just as bad in a, in a, in a philosophical sense. Maybe you can use this leverage. You can prove this, but not the original scheme or the original circular security. It's just as open as, uh, as uh, so this is the state of affairs. Yes, Andrew. Um, if in the program there, like, it, like, if you encrypted K, that would be still assuming circular security? If you encrypted K, if you encrypted K, it's not clear that functionality works, right? So, so, what you, so if you encrypted K with the homomorphic encryption scheme, let's say, yeah. and you did this computation, whatever you get out will be encrypted under K. Mm -hmm. But what I want is something that's encrypted under SKI. Okay. It doesn't give you the functionality. So homomorphic encryption has this nice property that I suppose you can compute anything under the encryption. Mm -hmm. But it has a bad property that whatever you get will be encrypted under the same key. Okay, and that's not what you want. Every time you press a button on this program, or rather feed an input to this program, you are supposed to get an encryption under a different key. How are you going to make that happen? Right? It's not clear at all. This is deja vu, okay, from 10 years ago. We tried that. We tried. We went down, you know, alleys. Um, yeah, but I'm sure there is a, I mean, there has to be a solution one way or the other. Hopefully one of you will think about that. All right, so that's homomorphic encryption. And so, right? That's Good. And now what do we want to do? Let me tell you one more thing, which is an application of homomorphic encryption. Um, that is private information virtually. The server has a has a database. It's not really a database. It's a, it's an array. Okay, it's an array. That's what it is. Okay, an array of length n, capital n. Um, the client has an index i, right? And he wants. Well, let me call this database db. Db of i. So here are two ways of doing it. The client sends the uh, this very small communication. I mean, you can't expect anything better, right? Uh, but then the client reveals the index to the server. And that's precisely what we want to prevent. Okay, so private information retrieval because the client wants to protect I and yet get DB of I. Here is another solution. 
uh, the server sends the database back to the, the entire database to the client. That's a good solution. The client is not revealing anything and just picks out the right entry. That's also not good because the communication complexity is very large. So you want to have small communication while keeping the client's input private. So one privacy of uh, I is what you want plus small communication. Small really is anything that's smaller than the size of the database. So if you get square root of n, I'm reasonably happy. If you get log n of 4 log n, 5 log n, then I'd be really happy. Yeah? 5 log n is what you need to communicate without any privacy. The client sends the log n bits of the index to the server, the server sends one bit back. So let's say the array is one bit, which one is one bit. That's the non private protocol. If you can do twice as worse as not the non private protocol, I'd be very happy. Right? Yeah, so, so small communication means square root n or even better, poly log n. Log n or poly log n. Yeah, this is what I want. Yeah, this is the goal. Um, so this was defined by Shore, old right. First thing they show is that if you want perfect security, sort of like a Shannon security, security against a computationally unbounded server, you cannot do it. You have to communicate n bits from the server to the client. Okay. That's the first result. Okay. That means cryptography is necessary. Like, so when you, you know, so that's, that's the first thing you think about. So I'm going to show you two solutions. One that, uh, that assumes that uses cryptography. So really, they said, look, uh, you know, there's not one way, but uh, the two ways to get around this impossibility of stuff, right? But, uh, yes. Um, do you care about if the client learns more than he should? about the server? Not now, but I could care. So the problem is uh, not trivial even without caring. And this requirement of hiding the database can be generically achieved. If you solve the other problem, you can solve the hiding the database <laughs> problem with about the same communication. So, yeah. Okay, so there are two ways to get around this lower bound. One is to say, Okay, that's all. That's the way we've always gotten our own load Okay, so make computational assumption. We make the assumption that the server is computationally bounded and use cryptography. Okay, so that's uh, solution number one. The other solution idea is to say, look, you know, it should ring a bell for those of you who were in Shafi's class, Shafi's lecture a couple of days ago, is to say, look, there is no one server. Okay, there are two servers. Maybe there are four servers. And these guys all have the same database. They have a replicated database. Then what the client is going to do is it is going to take its index and split it somehow and send each share to each of the servers. And the servers compute something, send it back, I reconstruct. Well, that's it. So the other way to get around it is you have two servers, S1 and S2, or maybe more, three and four. They all have the same database. And now the client interacts with uh, with these four guys. Okay. And here, I don't want to use cryptography. I want to actually get Shannon security, perfect security. Okay. So I either relax perfect security to computational security, that's one, one solution idea. Or I say, you know, not one server, many servers, but I still want perfect security. So both of these actually give, give you uh, non-trivial solutions. So 
Let's try to see both solutions. Okay. All right, so, so look, here is, uh, how would you solve, you know, let, I'll let you come up with a solution to one, the computational solution, yes. What you really want is like the elementary vector with one at i multiplied by n. So if you can just encrypt that vector and multiply it. Excellent. 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 Good. So what is the solution idea? The client encrypts i with the homomorphic encryption scheme. Okay. The server writes down the following function, f sub db, right? Which on input i outputs db of i. What is that function, which is what you're saying? You can write it as the following function. The sum of the database entries j, j goes from 1 to capital N, right? Times a function chi sub j of i. Chi sub j of i is 1 if i equals j and 0 otherwise. That is the, the, the delta function on j. But this gives you db of i, yes? Just keep it So this is a function, you know, this is a Boolean function. Just write down the function and write and draw a homomorphic encryption on it. Okay, that's it. What is the communication complexity? Well, you encrypt i, so you are going to spend the length of i, which is log n bits, times some security parameter. The output is the encryption of fdb of i, which is db of i, which is the encryption of one bit. So again, security parameter. So the total communication complexity is uh, log n times uh, polynomial in the security parameter. Okay? Some polynomials. This is up to the polynomial security parameter. This is the best you can. Now you can go in and you can optimize this even further. You can really get something like log n, uh, a constant multiple of log n plus the security parameter. That's the best, uh, this is very close to what you can get without privacy. Okay, that's solution one. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's immediate given homomorphic encryption how to solve this problem and uh, how to bring it. Okay, so now let's see, so no homomorphic encryption at this point. That's solution number two. But you have these replicated servers. Yes. And again, no cryptography, no one-way functions, no LWE, no factoring, nothing. You just have to do combinatorics in our flow. Yes. That's what I want. Okay. So let's try. Yeah, I'm going to show a solution with four servers. You can make it into uh, two. Let's start with four. Try with two. Okay. Start with two. So here is one way to write the database of one. Yeah, I think that's the database. Here is an algebraic way of writing this down. Think of the database as a vector, which it is, right? It's an, it's a, it's an array of uh, length n. Take the inner product with e sub i. e sub i is a unique vector, which says 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0 in the Yeah, that's that. I mean, it's easy, yeah? The, what you want is an inner product between the database and some vector that depends on real 
Okay, so the client says, okay, let me think about it for a bit. Um, I want to send some information to uh, server one and some information to server two, and these have to depend somehow on the index. Right? So, you know, these two pieces, either one by itself, reveals no information about the index, but put together, they reveal the index. Okay. What is that? Secret sharing. Secret sharing, of course. What do you secret share? You could secret share I, that would be fantastic, <coughs> but uh, I'm not, I don't know how to make that quite work. I'm going to secret share E sub I. Okay, so I take I, I make it into this unit vector, and I secret share that. What does secret sharing mean? This guy gets a random uh, vector, and this guy gets a random vector and so on with the I. So each one by itself looks totally random, but put together. Okay, fair enough. What do I do with these things? What, what do the servers do with these things? Right? Either one is totally random. Compute the product. Compute the inner product. Right? So this server has DB. So he computes DB in a product with R. This guy computes DB in a product with all computations are over GF2. That's why I wrote XOR. Right? And now what does the client do? He just exhausts the two together. Okay. He just, so this is one bit, yes? This is one bit. Exhort the two together, what do you get? You get db in a product with r xor r xor ei, which is ei, and that's exactly what you get. Okay, this is beautiful, except what is the communication complexity? From the client to, to the server, it is and bits, right? Capital and bits. And from the server back to the client, each server back to the client is one bit. So, so that's actually pretty good, right? I mean, because the other solution we had was the server sends the entire database to the, to the client. Now the server is only sending one bit, but the client is sending uh, you know, n bits, yeah? So we could do this. Okay, that makes us somewhat happy, but not a lot, right? because again, there's n bit. But we say, look, you know, I'm going to build the product. Okay. Then build the product. Okay. Now let's assume there are four servers. Okay, four servers. And these servers, they write the database in this funny way. They write the database not as an array, but as a matrix. Okay, square root n by square root n matrix. Makes sense. And the entry that the client wants is not, is one of these entries, let me denote it as the i comma j entry. Okay, so that's the i comma j entry. And how do I retrieve? What is the algebraic expression for retrieving? the i comma j entry, you multiply on the left by e sub i, yeah. on the right by e sub j, and that tells you what db of i comma j is. Yes. Good. Okay, so now what do I do with it? Right. What do I do with it? You see? So now again, you know, I want to, yeah, the client wants to somehow secret share something or the other. Yeah. Now I give you four servers. For some reason, you know, I said four servers. Yeah. Yes. Secret share EI and those two servers. Okay, so let's see. That actually works. So secret share EI, yeah. And secret share EJ, right? So this is good, yeah? This is what you're saying. So what do these guys send back? Well, the matrix times the share. The matrix times uh, the, the share. 
not what I was expecting, but yes, good, very good. So, right, so, so you get times dB from the first server, server one. So the two sends R times dB. So the three sends uh, dB times. See what Alex is saying? So, okay, so you know what? Let's say there are no server three and server four, okay? What happens when you absorb the, the two? You get EI times the dB, which is the entire ith row of dB. And of course, you can read off the data entry from it, okay? So, what is the communication complexity? Is square root n here, square root n here, square root n here, square root n here. So, the total of square root n. We in fact have a two server solution. Okay. Forget. Yeah? Yeah, so you have a two server solution with square root n complexity. All right. Okay. Uh, it's not often that I uh, that I deliver more than I promised. So <laughs> um, all right, you know what? Now that you guys are so quick, um, uh, I mean, it's probably worth seeing how you can do it with the servers in exact one bit anyway. One bit anyway, yeah? Okay, so let's say, okay, I'm going to tie your hands, Arsene, and say, you know, the servers can only send one bit back, okay? <laughs> and now we'll go figure. I'm not torturing you, Alex is. So. Okay, so again, let me erase everything. Again, this, the, the, the client sends square root n bits to each of the four servers, and the servers only send it's supposed to send one bit, one bit back. So I say, how do you get one bit out of the database? You can't multiply on the left and give me square root n bits. I have to multiply on the left and on the right. right. And then the whole thing collapses to one bit. Should I do it? Yeah. Okay, so let's just do it. Okay, so I secret share uh, R, right? I send it to these two guys, but I also send it to these two guys. Yeah, I secret share S, and I send it to these two guys. party now gets a distinct pair of things. What does he do? What, what does each party do? Server 1 does R plus di times db times s plus ej. Right? This guy does R times db times s plus ej. R plus ei times db times s. Yeah. What happens if you add all, all these four bits together? Each one is a bit now. What happens when you add them together? When you add these two things together, you get EI times DB times S plus EJ. When you add these things together, you get EI times DB times S. When you add those things together, you get EI times DB times EJ, which is precisely EJ. That's it. Okay, good. Homework exercise. Turns out that you can improve the square root n to cube root of n. So I'm not, you know, you can, anyone can send any number of bits. I'm not going to constrain you at this point. But you can do cube root of n. And, uh, and that's, it's not the best we know how to do, but that's the best I expect you to do in an exercise. <laughs> okay. So cube, so exercise, cube root of n. to this email me. <laughs>